Hi, everyone. Hi. 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 <laughs> uh, it's really, really, really good to be with you all this morning. Um, thank you uh, for everyone that was involved in giving me that chip. Um, yeah, three, three years ago yesterday, I had the last shittiest day of my life, uh, and now I'm here three years later, and um, it's incredible. It really is. I, I, I'm going to start this out in a weird way. Uh, my story is out there, so if you'd like to hear the whole story, and I mean every detail, you can go on our podcast, YouTube, all of that. It's definitely uploaded. Please don't look for, like, content being uploaded regularly, that's my job, so that will take a while to get trickled out. <laughs> uh, but the old ones are up there if you want to see that, that's all there. Um, but what life looks like for me right now uh, is what I want to sort of focus on today. Um, and, and what life looks like me for right now is, is way different than I ever expected it to look. Um, I am a Southern Baptist boy, uh, which means I grew up in the South. Uh, my dad was a pastor. My uncle was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor for a little bit. Everyone was a pastor. Um, and I grew up in church like it was the only world that I had. Um, we moved around a ton, so we moved around every two years. And in that, like, I would move from sort of evangelical church to evangelical church. And we went to places like Amsterdam and New York and, like, spaces like that. And honestly, I had sort of a Southern Baptist experience in all of those places. <laughs> it never really, like, moved from there. Um, but it was always my constant. And with that, God was always my constant. God was my best friend um, from age five onward. Uh, I became a Christian when I was five years old, uh, which meant we actually, it was like Halloween and we went to this harvest festival because I wasn't allowed to trick or treat. Does anybody resonate with that? Yeah, all right. We all have some trauma bonding at the beginning here. Uh, I went to a harvest festival and I heard legend that there were these huge full-size candy bars uh, in the neighborhood. All the kids were kind of talking about, after this, I'm going trick-or-treating, and I'm going to get like a king-size Butterfinger. And I was like, I'm sorry? That's just out there like in the world? And so I whined and complained to my dad, who was the associate pastor at the time. And I kind of, I think I threw like a hissy fit at like five. And so he finally like relented. He was like, fine, just don't make me look bad in church. Like, we'll take you out after this. Just be cool during the Harvest Festival. So I was very cool during the Harvest Festival. And then we went outside, and we went trick-or-treating, and the first house we went to was our neighbor's, and it had this giant witch that popped out of a box. <laughs> and coming from, like, the Harvest Festival, where, like, the, the edgiest thing was, like, a kid in a Batman outfit. <laughs> uh, coming to that, and just, like, a witch, like, boom, I was in tears, and I was scared, and I was frantic. Uh, we came home, and my dad put me in bed, uh, and I was like, Dad, why are there all those scary things out there in the world? And he said, you don't need to worry about those scary things because you've got Jesus. And that was like, you know, the most stereotypical evangelical line. But to my five-year-old little heart, that was true. That wasn't a lie. That was something he was offering as like a true thing that could keep me from fear. And when I said yes to Jesus in that moment, what I really was saying yes to is maybe there's something in the world that can make this world a less scary place. Maybe there's something out there that cares for me enough that I don't have to walk through the world like a bunch of witches are going to pop out. <laughs> Maybe I can take it one step at a time uh, and live a beautiful life and that there's something that wants me to live a beautiful life. And that relationship obviously changed over time um, and alcoholism got in there. Uh, but my relationship with God, weirdly, was always there. Um, it wasn't something like God went away. It was more just like our conversation changed. And for a while, I really, really, really did not want to participate or even talk with God. Um, it wasn't something that I was interested in, and I was a pastor, or pa a pastor, a pastor professionally, and so that made things very, very awkward. Um, and what I know to be true three years later, which isn't a long time, and I know that, but three years later, I, I can really tell you that if you try and force yourself into something that you are not passionate about, that you don't have the truth in anymore, you will explode. Your life will hurt. Um, and that's because you're not giving yourself fully to anything. You're dragging half of you there and you're leaving half of you behind. And that creates a dissonance and a tension. And really what it does is it creates this total out of place reality. So this place I felt so at home in, so like friendly in for my entire life suddenly became a space for me as an alcoholic and someone who had to like deal with that pretty publicly, uh, it became an unsafe space. It became a space where I didn't feel like anything cared for me anymore. And that made me feel profoundly out of sorts 
with my whole life, um, with the universe, with God, uh, with everything, just out of place. And what I found that was pretty beautiful is the people that actually helped me through this journey and brought me to where I am, they were out of the place people too. They were people who had experienced something in their life that disrupted their life to the point that they would come to rooms in church basements and they would talk about the hardest days of their life and they would laugh. And in those rooms, I gained confidence and I, I got myself back, but it took a lot of give and take. Just on a really practical level, I've been on staff at New Abbey for four years as a recovery pastor. This is my three-year anniversary. <laughs> Y'all can do the math on that. Um, but it took a lot of going back Going back in, going out, going back in. Um, I went to seven. I had to calculate this and actually call my dad last night because I couldn't remember. I was like, how many detoxes did I go to? And he was like, seven. He <laughs> said it so fast. I was like, seven. And I paid for all of them. Uh, but <laughs> he quickly knew that number. Um, and a detox is a place I pray you never have to be in. I really do. Um, but if you are there, uh, it is the most painful place in the universe, uh, and it's also one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Um, I met people in these detoxes that I can't even describe. Like, usually you think when you're going to go into one of these situations that everyone there is somehow going to be bad. And especially from, like, my upbringing and my background, I thought all of these other alcoholics and drug addicts were going to be, like, th some of the worst people I'd ever been around. And I got into these detoxes, and what I found is, like, no. Like, these are some of the most beautifully hurt people you could ever imagine. Um, I, I went to a, a, a detox in Thousand Oaks, which is, yeah, where a detox should be. Uh, Thousand Oaks, California. And I went there a couple times, so many times that I kind of became like a regular there. Like, uh, they called me Rev because <laughs> they knew I was a pastor. And so I'd come in and they'd be like, oh, Rev's back. Um, and there was one tech in particular that I just, like, fell in love with. Her, her name was Sammy. She was this awesome, like, cursed like a sailor, like, rode a Harley to work, always had this sweet leather jacket that smelled like unfiltered cigarettes. Uh, and we would have these long chats, Sammy and I. She was a Christian, and so she wanted to talk to me about how a pastor could end up in a detox. <laughs> and we would talk, and we would talk. Um, and she still had this connection to her faith that was so raw and so real. Um, it, was, it was so palpable, and the way that she spoke, it reminded me of what that God felt like at five years old, that God that really cared about me, that God that actually wanted to keep me from the scary things in life. And so whenever I could get near Sammy, if Sammy was in the room, I was near Sammy, trying to help with anything I could. There's nothing to do in a detox. You're not allowed to have your phone. There are very few electronics. So really what you're doing is you're either in bed, like working it out, or you're literally just like, like in, in a room, sitting, staring at a wall. <laughs> hey, there's not much to do. So anytime she would come in the room, I'd be like glued to her. Like, can I help you? Can we do anything? Um, and it got so boring, and this was during COVID, so it was like triple boring. We couldn't go outside. Uh, that I was like, could we, could we just like, they were bringing in these dinners, and they were terrible, and everybody knew it. And I was like, could we just cook? Like, if you give me the reins here, Sammy, and, and we can have a grocery budget, and I, I promise you, for like 40 bucks, there were like six people in the detox at this point, I was like, we could probably feed everyone here, we can make it like a game out of it, it'll be like a great night. And she was like, fine, I don't want to go pick up the food anyway, so here you go, we'll go to the grocery store. So we did it, and this group of six of us came alongside, um, and they were six of the wildest people you could ever imagine, and we went into a Vons in Thousand Oaks, and we started pulling things to make spaghetti, uh, and then we pulled like a cookie mix, and we were going to make cookies and spaghetti. <laughs> Those literally the only two things we had. Uh, we had $40 to work with. So we got to the end. We get the cookies. We get the spaghetti. We come back inside, uh, and someone puts on music. And wow, like there's music playing in the detox, but we'd never had the power of the choice over music. <laughs> and so somebody put on like songs, like their favorite songs. And then we all took the phone, and we all started playing our favorite song. And then we all started singing together as we're like cooking spaghetti and like cookies. And I remember there was this girl, Sarah, and she may have weighed like 40 pounds. She was the tiniest person I'd ever seen. Uh, and she was this little 20-year-old Pepperdine student. And uh, it came around and, and the Backstreet Boys uh, came on, which, you know, is just like, even in a detox, everybody knows the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> so it was quit playing games with my heart, and it gets to the chorus, and we're all singing, and I'm like calling it out. I'm like, Perry, go, and he sings, and then we get, to, we get around to Sarah, and nobody knew this, but Sarah was actually a classically trained operatic singer. <laughs> and so when it got to her, she was like, quit playing games, and we all lost it, like just lost it. 
And that was this beautiful moment where I looked around and I was like, this feels like family. This, this feels good. This shouldn't feel good. I'm in a bad place. Why does this feel so good? And then I realized this feels like church. This is the best version of what church should be. We all bring what we can. We all sing when we can. And some can sing louder and better than others. And we lean on them in those moments. But suddenly, a room full of outsiders created an inside. And we were all back on the inside of something, if not for just a few hours before our heads all hit the pillow, and the next day, we kind of awoke to what was. But that's the power of being inside. That's the power of going from outside and going to inside. And you'll notice in that story, no one had any pivotal sort of physical moment where they're like, I'm more sober than I was an hour ago. That wasn't the case. Wholeness came into the picture when we were still incredibly unwell. And I think that is the most beautiful lesson in recovery that I have learned, is that you do not have to be well to be whole. You do not have to be perfect to be loved and accepted just the way that you are. And I think about that just in terms of how big this issue is that I've had to walk through. Uh, you know, like it, it's one in eight Americans. One in eight Americans will have some bout with addiction in their life, whether that's a long-term struggle and fight or it's just a quick blip. One in eight people will deal with this at some point. That's a lot of outsiders. And what's even more shocking about that is if it's one in eight, that means that problem is everywhere, and really, we are not talking about it. <laughs> it's like the last thing we want to talk about. In fact, as soon as a lot of you probably saw that a recovery pastor came up here, you were like, oh, no. <laughs> right? There's a gut reaction of like, oh, gosh, because it's something that's close to all of us. Think about it. If one in eight, it could happen to you, it could happen to a family member, it could happen to a friend, and likely it's happened to one of those in your life, and you've had to either walk through it or you've been the victim of the shrap metal that's come off of that experience. And to every person in that mosaic, God bless you. Like every piece matters. But it's one in eight. That's a huge, massive amount of outsiders. And I think it was beautiful. Corey gave me this topic to preach on this morning, this verse. And we both looked at each other and we're like, that's kind of like perfect for this. And it's, it's Mark. We're, we're coming to the last verse in Mark, which I am very proud of. That means we've made it through a whole chapter here. <laughs> There's a lot more chapters in Mark, so we'll be here for like another five years or something, but we're ending chapter one today. Uh, so follow along with me in Mark chapter one. It says, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Next slide there, if there is, yeah. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but sh go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went, back, or he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news as a result. Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places, yet people still came to him from everywhere. So can we go back to like just that first, first line of that scripture there, where he just approaches him. There it is. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This is the one in a year chance I have to use the seminary education I paid for and all that Southern Baptist trauma and upbringing. So here we go. This is what this verse means on a deep level, and I'm so excited to get nerdy on this. Uh, a man with leprosy could be any sort of disease. So it wasn't necessarily just leprosy. In fact, it could be like weird baldness, which is me, so I could be in that camp. It could be anything. Uh, it could just be literally that you were ostracized from the community. And if you were ostracized from the community, you were placed within the category of a leper, like someone who had to be on the outside. And the deal for that was because it was extremely communicable disease. It, it was spreadable, and so if you got around someone, you could get it. And so it made this sort of inside and outside thing very practical and very real. There were people who were on the inside who could go inside the temple, and then there were people on the outside, and they couldn't go in the temple. 
The lepers had this like weird little um, sort of loophole in that system where they could go into the temple before everyone goes in, and then they would put up this huge sheet so you'd be behind a literal veil. Then the rest of the people would come in, worship, they would be allowed to leave, and the lepers would all have to stay there until the very, very end so that they were not seen or heard, and then they were told to leave. So it was that separated. Also, and this is like a fun one, um, they were in debt. The word for debt and sin is literally interchangeable in most places, especially in the book of Mark. Um, The reason for that is the leper would have had to atone for these sins or these unclean things in them, and there was a way to do that. So there was a way to get back into sort of the social order, even if you weren't healed, and that was to go to the priests, and if the priests would actually sanctify you and they would do all the rituals, then you could rejoin society at least for a little bit. Um, But the problem was that costs money. And so for the first couple legs of the leper's journey, there was a time where they could pay to be cleansed and then reenter society. But if you saw a person who couldn't do that, what you knew was they are out of money, they are out of people who will give them money, and they are completely alone in the world. And so even besides the physical ailment, these are people that are literally kept at more than arm's length. They are over there, and we don't talk about them. And so when this person approaches Jesus, they approach him, and it has to be that they've already gone to those priests. They've already tried every other avenue. And so this is a bit of theater to see if Jesus will participate with him, to see if this new kingdom, this thing that he's talking about, is actually as big as he's talking about. Does it have room for someone like me, someone like me that's been kept at arm's length on the outside and not on the inside. And the language here is so, so specific. Can we throw up that second line where it says he's indignant? Jesus was indignant. One of the uh, passages I read, the translation said, Jesus' guts churned inside of him. (laughs) Another one said he was incensed. Another said filled with rage. And then finally, most of them say filled with compassion. But I think it's super interesting that the initial sort of reaction is anger, is of course I will. That's Jesus' response to someone saying, will you see me as a person? Will you see me with dignity? And Jesus meets that person without asking anything else, no other questions. Like, do you read your Bible? Do you go to church every Sunday? Did you pray the right prayer to be here in my presence right now? None of it. Just anger, and he reaches out, and he touches that person. And in touching that person, he is made clean. And it says that the leprosy left him. That's awesome. I hope that is 1,000% true. But what's socially true, and we can actually quantify it and go, that really did happen, is that that person was made clean socially by Jesus. But the act of Jesus touching him, and again, I told you we're going to get nerdy, but this is fun. The act of touching this leper would have made Jesus ritually unpure, right? So what that means is, and there's no, there's nothing in the Bible after this of Jesus going to the priest and saying, can you make me unclean for that little bit about the leper back there? I kind of need to keep going on this. There's nothing there. He's unclean the whole rest of the time. And so when it says he can't go back into cities and stuff, that's not because he's just this famous guy, which happened too. But the other part of it is he can't actually be in the center because now he is ritually impure. There is no space for him in the center. He's on the outside with the outside. And so at the very last line of that, it says he had to go be out in lowly places. And man, thank God he did. Because those lowly places still exist, and those lowly places are where we find immense healing. I work with addicts and alcoholics every day now. So part of my life is I'm a spiritual director, um, and I make a living at that, which is a totally weird thing. Uh, But I do back-to-back session. On Friday, I had eight sessions in a row, which was insane for me. This is all new. Um, And so when I sit with them, the, the primary thing that I can tell It's not that they are upset about this disease thing that they have. Uh, It's not that they're upset that they have to battle this addiction. Most of what we're talking about is, ah, I did this, and I don't think anyone's ever going to forgive me for that. I can't go home for Christmas this year because I did this. That's the pain 
that we're working with. And that's the pain that diseases like this bring. It almost has nothing to do with the substance. It has everything to do with the pain that that thing has caused in their life. They believe that they can't participate fully. That I am somehow on the outside and that with the people that I love, I've placed myself on the outside and now I feel like I have no voice on the inside or that I'm not welcome there. And I promise you the moment I see things turn and the moment things turn in my life was when I began to understand that it's nothing that I do that gives me the permission to be on the inside. It's just a personal knowing. It's a deep knowing that I am loved, that I have dignity, that my life matters, that places me on the inside whether people like it or not. Whether people can deal with that or not, it places me back on the inside. And the real reason that I learned that uh, was because my addiction got me isolated. So when, when, I fir- when, when it first hit, uh, and I got honest, this was uh, December 29th of 2019, and I checked into Betty Ford, which is a treatment center in um, Palm Springs, and uh, I, I didn't want to be there at all. I didn't want to be with these people. I thought these people were, um, you know, kind of nuts. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I belong here type of a thing. And I went in, and uh, there was a weird, mysterious flu going around. Um, and it was taking people out left and right. People were literally out on stretchers, and, and the ER was being called, and they were having to go to the hospital because of this flu. And the rehab specifically told my wife, like, listen, your husband is going to call you, and he's going to make up an excuse not to be here anymore. Like, he's going to say that something's wrong, or I can't be here because this isn't right, or they're doing something wrong. And so I called her, and I was like, listen. And she got the call, and she knew. She's like, well, here it is. And I was like, there really is this flu. It's, it's taking people out. I can't describe it. Like, it's, it's really bad. you got to get me out of here. And she's like, Josh, just stay. Just stay. Now, I stayed, but that was December 29th of 2019. Do you know what that flu was? That was COVID, and it was taking people out right and left, and I stayed, so that, that's beautiful. <laughs> but at the same time, I'd like to say here three years later, I was right <laughs> in that moment. Um, but participating in that space and being with other people who were going through this, I actually found this great relief. I found people that I could talk to, like, honestly and really. And I began to grow, and one of my roommates, um, his name is Neil, and we're still, like, best friends to this day, and we discovered that we lived four blocks away from each other in Santa Monica, um, and that we both had a love for The Simpsons, that he happened to be an actor, and he could do all of the voices to every single Simpsons character, and so we spent every night where I'd be like, Barney, say this, and he would say it back to me, and we would just laugh, and we'd have a great, great time, but it was that community and feeling a part of something and in something that like truly, truly made me whole. Because the truth was, I really didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. The big dramatic moment, if you wanna go back and look at my story, um, is that I actually preached drunk in front of a crowd, and it was one of the lowest moments of my life. I'll never forget that, even though I have like two hazy memories of it, Um, it's enough. It, It wakes me up at night still. Um, and leaving that situation made me feel like I never have a place here on this stage, and I just, I don't know where my place is in the universe. And so every time I would get confidence in a place like Betty Ford and the community would come around me, I would feel better, and then I would go out back into my real life, and I would feel worse, and then I would drink to cope with that, and then that cycle would just continue, and that cycle continued for like three years, and to the point that everyone in my life was so exhausted. It's like, Josh, what are you doing? Can't you get this? We're all here, but we've been trying a long time now. Can't you turn the corner? And at my lowest of lows, uh, everyone had left. My wife was gone. My dog was gone. My job was gone. Everything was gone. And I was in this one-bedroom apartment in Santa Monica with the power turned off, hanging out alone, drinking out of a huge bottle, And it just so happened that I had a staff meeting with Corey. (laughs) Uh, And I popped open my computer and did the meeting with Corey on Zoom. And I could tell, he could tell, something was not right with me. Um, And I I don't even remember what the meeting was about, but we got off the call. And he called me. And I was like, oh, shoot. (laughs) Here it comes. And I picked up that phone call, fully being prepared to be yelled at, to be berated, And I picked up the call, and Corey 
just really, really calmly was just like, Josh, are, are you okay? And my go-to was to lie to him because I had been lying to everyone. I was like, oh, no, everything's fine. And I'm going back to my apartment with no power on it and just hanging out and doing nothing but drinking. Uh, and he could just tell. Like, I looked worked and worn down. And he asked me again, Josh, are you okay? And I broke. I, I told him, no, I'm not okay. Um, he's like, did you relapse? And I said, yeah. And it was the first time I said that to anyone, including my sponsor at that point. I just literally was like, yes. And then he asked a question, which I will never forget, because most of the time after you say that you've relapsed or that you've messed up or that something happened, there's either a, well, you get back on the horse, go do this, go do that, you know, just a bunch of suggestions, a bunch of help that doesn't really help. That wasn't Corey's response. He actually asked me straight up, he's like, where's Chelsea? That's my wife. No one had asked me that. And I told him, she's, she's gone. She's at her parents, and we haven't talked. And his response was not, what are you doing? I can't believe that, anything. He just said, Josh, we will do anything to make this work. We will do anything to bring you two back together, whatever we have to do. I am at your full disposal. This church is at your full disposal. We will get you whole. And I have to tell you that, like, hearing that from a pastor, there was this profound moment, and there are a lot of different profound moments in recovery, and you just have to kind of pick one most of the time for a story, but this is a huge profound moment that a pastor spoke something into me, and then it broke through whatever walls of cynicism, guardedness, deconstructy, I don't even believe that anymore. He reached right in and just said, we're going to care for you. And we're going we're gonna to care for you regardless of if you get well or if you don't. His statement was not, if you go to rehab, we'll do anything we can to get you guys to be back together. It was just, we'll do everything we can. And nothing special really happened out of that. There was no, like, sort of, like, boot camp for my marriage or anything that followed. Uh, all there was was the ability to call Corey, like, whenever I felt like I, I just didn't know what to do. And that person, I don't even know if he's in here right now, but he became a rock for me to be able to lean on. And then also, and this is really important, he's a pastor. And that was a person I didn't want to hear anything from in that moment. And suddenly I could trust a pastor again. And if I could trust a pastor again, there was like a slight, slight chance that I might be able to trust this whole God thing again. And even more so, this whole Christianity thing again. And that slowly unwound itself, and Corey never got rid of me. I mean, that's the most incredible part. Like, I'm still here. Maybe he didn't catch on, <laughs> but I, I'm still here in this place. Uh, and he never let me go, and neither did any of you. I think what's profoundly special about this place, and it doesn't get said enough, is that this is the type of place that can take an outsider and turn them into an insider. This is the place where you can be you no matter what in so many different iterations, and I'm telling you, it's really, 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 really rare. I don't know of another space like this in Los Angeles, and I honestly don't know many across the US. It's a crazy reality that God gifted me with a blessing that was, I was just near it. <laughs> I was just near it. And so the whole rest of my journey has been trying to catch up to why did this work for me, and why are so many of my friends still struggling, and, and why are so many of these people that I know still struggling? And I think the answer is, like, they didn't have a community like this to be able to lean on and heal in. Like, this is a place um, where you can just come and be, and you can be you for as long as you need to be. That tech team back there has saved my life. <laughs> and the reason is, is because I don't, I don't preach, I don't play. I wind cables and mix and hear, and God has put me in a position in church right now where all I'm doing is listening, and it's been the most healing and beautiful experience of my entire church life. Just winding these cables. It almost feels like a monk, like peeling a potato. <laughs> like that's what it feels like every day as I come into this space, and I get to be with all of you. Um, and that is about all I have. Uh, so we're going to get back in those groups. 
and you're going to answer this question. What would it take for you to feel in place? 